Life is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. Uh, uh, I, I can't open this jar. See if mom can open it. Just take your time in there, okay? No means maybe. Hey, why don't you bring that ball inside and play with it? Hey, don't put that back where you found it. Just leave it on the floor. Ew, bacon. If you put a dent in the car, it's really no big deal. It's 10 a.m. Go back to bed. Look, whatever your friends are doing, just do the exact same thing. I got more than enough sleep last night. If your friends are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Stop signs are just a suggestion. You don't need a chaperone. You don't need a seatbelt. You don't need a savings account. You should buy the jeans with the holes in them. Hey, we're all gonna go to church, but you can just sleep in, okay? Can we please just hang out in here for another 10 minutes? Hey, can we get some more bickering back there? All right, bills! Yay, traffic! Woohoo, taxes! Yes! Laundry! Hey, can you kids come in here and jump on my bed? Quick, go tell mom what happened right away. You don't need to finish your dinner. Hey, look at your phone when I'm talking to you. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason. Texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna bungee jump out of this tree. That's a really good idea. Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. We're so thankful for all of the things that you do say and all the things that you don't say. We're so glad that you're here this morning. And we have a special gift for all of the men in our family of faith. There's a devotional out in the foyer. You're welcome to pick one up on your way out. It's a great way for you to connect with God in the days and weeks to come. There's some great things going on in the life of our church. I hope you'll check it out in the bulletin. You can also check it out on our website or our St. Andrew's app. But we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us here at St. Andrews where our mission is making disciples of Jesus Christ. And I want to say a special word of welcome to those who are worshiping with us online as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started today. God, we are so grateful for you, for your love for us, and we're grateful for the fathers and the men in our lives who have been examples of who you are. God, I pray that you would bless them this day, help them to know how much they mean to us. God, let us serve you faithfully. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Let's stand as we worship together.
Would you remain standing with me? And as a family of faith, let us affirm our faith together. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated, and at this time, I'd like to invite our elementary age students to meet our friends at the back of the worship center today. If you'd like to go to Children's Church, parents and grandparents, you can pick them up in the Community Life Center following the service today. It is such a fun day to be celebrating the men in our lives who have made such a difference. And I love Father's Day because I love to take the time and go back and think about all of the lessons I've learned from my dad over the years. My dad was a pastor for 43 years, and I used to love listening to him preach. We used to have great, deep conversations on our back porch about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I love reminiscing about those lessons that I have learned. But there was one time I learned a lesson from my dad where he didn't speak any words. You see, we had a basset hound growing up, and her name was Muffin, and she was so much fun. We got her as a puppy, and if you know basset hounds, you know they have really long ears and kind of big feet, and they have long bodies, and I remember when Muffin was a puppy, and she'd run up the stairs in our house, and she would trip on her ears, but as she got older, she worked her way into our hearts, and she truly became a member of the family. And that is why it was so sad the day we learned that she had cancer and we had to put her down. And I remember that day the vet came to our house and was able to do all of that there in our home so that we could be with Muffin. And I remember that my dad and my mom and I were there in our backyard. I still remember where she was laying on the back patio and we all knelt down beside her. And as the vet was doing her work and being so caring, I remember looking over at my dad, this big, strong, spiritual giant in my life and he was knelt down beside muffin and i remember him taking his hand and he just placed his hand on her back 
And as the tears streamed down his face, he didn't say a word. He closed his eyes, and I knew he was praying. And so me being 14 years old at the time, I just did what my dad did. And I took my hand, and I laid my hand on Muffin's back, and I began to pray. And in that moment, where no words were spoken, everything was done in silence, I learned one of the most important lessons from my dad, and that is that all life matters. From the highest, most important person that you'll ever meet in the world to the lowliest animal on the planet, all life matters to God. And so today, as you think about what you will give, I hope you will remember that when we give of ourselves, what we give goes to help all of life, from the people that are the most important in our world to the lowliest of souls. The gifts that we give go to help all life because all life is important. So I hope you'll think on that as you give today. There's three giving stations here in the worship center, two up front, one in the back. You can drop in your offering during the singing of this next song. If you're watching with us online today, then you can text give to the number that you'll see come up in just a moment. Thank you for giving generously on this Father's Day.
St. Andrews is a loving, caring, overcoming community of faith centered in a relationship with Jesus, and we also happen to believe in the power of prayer. Paul encourages us in Philippians 4, 6. He says, not to worry about anything, but pray about everything. I mean, I know for some of us, myself included in this, that's much easier said than done. Um, at times, I like to convince myself that if I worry about it instead of pray about it, I can hold on to it, and I actually have something to say about the outcome of it, which is ridiculous, right? And so my hope is that this morning, those of us that are warriors and those of us that are not, that we would all pray about everything this morning, that we would release it to God and not worry about it. And so as we prepare our hearts to do that this morning, you'll see some names scrolling on the screen behind me, and some of them we, we don't have any idea what the specific prayer need is, but we trust and we know that God does, and God is at work in their lives, and we can all agree with that, that God is a good God at work in their lives. Um, But we also know many that have specific prayer needs, um, right? We have those that right now are battling and struggling and fighting courageously cancer, and we this morning lift them up and cover them in our prayers We pray for a complete healing of their bodies. We pray that the doctors would have wisdom and discernment and that God would place his healing hands on them and move in mighty, mighty ways. Those that are homebound, some are worshiping with us right now online, we pray that they would have peace, that they would know that they are a part of this worship family even though they may not be able to physically be with us, and that God would place His loving arms around them and remind them daily that they're not alone, that God is with them and that we are with them. Um, Also, our missionaries, that we not only support financially but in prayer. Um, I I love this passage in Acts where they're praying, um, and they weren't praying for protection. They weren't praying for um, provision. They were simply praying for boldness. Right? And, and I trust that God is protecting our missionaries and he's providing for them. But this morning, let's pray for boldness, that they would have boldness and open doors to share the gospel with those that are lost and hurting, with those that have not heard before, that they would come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ because of the missionaries that we support. We also pray for the expectant mothers and families that um, as they are uh, battling through the heat of summer, that God would bless them abundantly, that God would protect them and guide them and look over them, and that um, everything would go as planned and that they would have healthy, happy babies. We also pray for those that are deployed, that God would protect them, that God would guide them, that God would remind them that they are loved and that we are back here praying for them. And we also lift up their families that are um, that are, are struggling with maybe not even knowing where it is that they're deployed to or not knowing if they're okay right now or what they're doing. We pray that God would give them peace and comfort as well. And we also pray for our fathers. Um, we pray for those that um, may be our spiritual fathers. And we lift those men up that God has placed in our lives and we pray that God would bless them abundantly to be a blessing, to continue to be a blessing, to continue to guide us and teach us and lead us. And then a specific prayer for those that are grieving today, those that have lost their dads or have lost their grandfathers. I know that we've lost a couple of grandfathers just in the last couple of years, and it's hard, and it's days days like today that remind you of that loss. And so we pray a special prayer for those of you that are dealing with that, that you would be comforted and that you would remember all of the great things and all the great times that you spent with those amazing men in your life. As DA prepares to come up and share a a great message with us this morning, let's also lift him up in prayer. So if you'll bow your heads with me, let's pray. Father God, we love you and we're so thankful for the ways at which you are at work in our lives for the ways in which you are at work in the life of this church with so many incredible things coming up, with VBS coming up, with um, kids going to camp, um, with Bible studies that are going right now, with all kinds of ways that you are at work. We thank you and we praise you. We are excited for this season of ministry, this season that you are at work in our lives and for what you have ahead. We are so thankful that you know our prayer needs, that you know our concerns, that you, need, that you know the things that we're struggling with, the things that we lift up well before we know them, well before we speak them out or even realize that it's a need. 
you are sovereign. You are already at work. And we pray for your will to be done in all those areas of our lives. Thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We recognize that you are a great God, that you are set apart and holy, but you are also near and you are good and you are faithful and we can trust that. This morning, we pray for your will to continue to be done in our lives. We pray for healing and we pray for miracles throughout this church and throughout our extended families. We pray that it would all be done in your name and for your glory. And we pray for reconciled relationships as many of us may struggle with broken relationships in our lives that you would reconcile those things that you would make all things new that you would help those relationships to be healed in your name and for your glory we pray for boldness and courage to share your love with a broken lost world with with neighbors with friends with family that may not know you or may need to know your hope in this season of their life that you would use us for that and give us the boldness and courage to do that we also lift up Pastor D.A. to you this morning. We pray that you would anoint him with your Holy Spirit, that you would fill him with your spirit, that he would speak boldly and clearly your message and your words this morning, and that you would prepare our hearts for, for those words, that we would be transformed by your word and by your presence. And thank you for your power and the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you for the gift of your son Jesus and the prayer that he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Which one? This one? Or this one? This one, okay. How y'all like my earring? So a man was uh, traveling through the countryside. I think his battery died. And um, his, his car broke down. And he looked around, and the only place he could go for help was a monastery. So he walks up to the monastery, he knocks on the door, and he asked them if he can spend the night. And, of course, the monks welcomed him with hospitality. They said, yes, come on in, and they gave him a meal. They even repaired his car for him uh, while he was spending the night there. But he really didn't sleep well that night. As he laid down to go to bed, he heard the most beautiful, alluring sound that he had ever heard. He could not figure out what the sound was, but he was so enamored with it. It's like when the sirens tried to seduce Odysseus into wrecking his ship that they, he just had to know what that sound was. So the next morning he got up and before he left he said, you know, I hardly slept last night. That, that sound was so beautiful. It was so great. Can you tell me what that sound was? And they said, well, we can't tell you because you're not a monk. And so it was that the man left very disappointed. A couple of years go by. All he can think about is this sound. So he goes back to the monastery. He knocks on the door again. He said, maybe you remember me. My car broke down. Y'all fixed my car for me. He goes, I just, I've got to ask again. I've got to know what was that sound. It was the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. And again, they replied to him, we can't tell you. You're not a monk. And he said, well, I've got to know what that sound was, and if that means I have to become a monk, then tell me what I must do to become a monk. He said, well, to become a monk, you have to travel the earth, you have to count every blade of grass and every grain of sand, and then come back and tell us what you have discovered. Years go by. The man comes back. His hair is grayed. His body is bent. And they said, come on in and tell us what you've discovered. And he, he went in and he said, so I have been on this quest for years 
to become a monk because I have to know what that sound is. And here's what I've discovered. The earth is always changing. It's in a constant state of change. What you asked me to do was impossible. No one can know the answer to that but God. But we as humans, if we can strip ourselves of all self-deception, might come to know something. And all the monks began to smile and they began to clap and they said, congratulations, you have become a monk. And that's when the, the head monk grabbed him and said, come with me. And they walked down a long corridor and they got to a heavy wooden door and he gave him a key and he said, the answer you search for is behind this door. And so the man turned the key and he opened the door and there was another door, a stone door. And they handed him another key and he opened that and there was another door. It was a ruby door. And so on it went with a pearl door, a sapphire door, an emerald door, a diamond door, until finally he comes to a gold door. And the old monk smiles and hands him a key and says, this is the last key to the last door. He was trembling a little bit because his whole life had been to discover what was behind that door. And he turned the key and he slowly opened the door and a look of joy came over his face and he fell to his knees as he discovered what the sound was. But I can't tell you because you're not a monk. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you for not throwing rotted fruit at me. But aren't you glad that it's not that hard to become a part of the church. That's what we're looking at. We, we don't have to go on some great quest. The most important question we answer is about who Jesus is. And then the second most important question is what does that mean and how I live my life. And, and what we discover is, first of all, we must remember God creates the church. We don't create it. God creates the church. God just uses people for this creation. It's different than when God created the universe and spoke and it was. God works in the lives and the hearts and the understandings of people to create the church. And we read about this in Acts chapter 2 whenever the Holy Spirit was poured out on all who were gathered. There was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. There was the appearance of flames of fire sitting on their shoulders. There was the sound of people speaking their own languages but hearing all the others in their languages. And when people saw that and they asked what happened, Peter stands up and he explains, this is what Joel prophesied about. This is what God has always promised God was going to do. And you need to know that you too can receive this spirit if you would profess Jesus as both Messiah and Lord. And so it was people turned from sin and they turned to faith in God and they were baptized. And it says that of all the people gathered for this Jewish holiday, there were 3,000 of them that professed faith in Christ that day. And so the question then for us today is, is that all there is? Is that all there is? Well, I certainly think there is more for us to learn on what it means to create the church. So I want you to give your attention to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, a very popular scripture. Most of you may know this, but I invite you to read this aloud with me today. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. This is the word of the Lord. So, creating the church out of people, and now we have this recipe with four ingredients, and we're going to spend the next four weeks looking at these things, and today we're going to start with this idea that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, I want to be very upfront with you today. If you've been around the church a long time, if you are a, a maturing person of faith, I'm not going to say anything today that you probably don't already know. If you come to church hoping from some, for some deep revelation, today ain't the day you're going to get that. <laughs> you know, it's just not what's going to happen. And yet, I always hold out the hope. And I always hold out the belief that whenever we gather to worship, not everybody here is at the same place as far as spiritual maturity is concerned. And so sometimes we have to go back and remember some of those foundational teachings of our faith. In fact, in the first service, we sang the greatest hymn in the history of hymns. I love to tell the story. And if you know the lyrics of that song, one of the things it says is, I love to tell the story for some have never heard. 
And so the thought is that we all need to be reacquainted with foundational things, but maybe some have never heard. And today we're going to look at what it means for the apostles' teaching. And I'll just say that uh, we're going to answer a couple of very basic questions. The first question is this. Who were the apostles? Can you name them? Can you name the apostles? If you uh, guessed Peter, <laughs> that's a good starting point because Peter is the one in Acts 2 that is telling them to do all this stuff. And if you're saying, now there were 11 more, eh, no, <laughs> Judas had killed himself. <laughs> there were only 10 left that you're probably thinking of. And if you read Acts chapter 1, I believe it's verses 13, 14, it'll tell you who those 10 were. And then before you finish that chapter, it says, but they knew they needed to replace Judas, so they picked another one. And for them to pick another one, that apostle had to have credentials. He had to meet a certain number of qualifications in order for consideration as an apostle to happen. And the qualifications were this. He had to have been with Jesus for a long time. And yes, at that point, it definitely was a he, not a he or a she. The she's were important, and we see their role later. But for them, it was a he. He had to be with Jesus for a long time. He had to have heard Jesus teach. He had to have heard uh, or seen the, the miracles that Jesus did. And most importantly, that person must have seen Jesus after Jesus was resurrected from the grave. Those were the qualifications that were had. But here's something we all know about those 12. They're dead. I mean, those were the apostles, and they're dead. They are in the church triumphant. They're part of the cloud of witnesses, however you want to think of that. We have witness left behind them because a lot of the New Testament was written by Peter and Paul and James and John. Those were all apostles that helped to write this. And I know you're thinking, wait, Paul wasn't one of the 12. You're correct. Paul actually writes in his letter, I was an apostle that was untimely born. He did not see Jesus when Jesus was in his ministry, but he has an experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus when Jesus says, this is Jesus whom you're persecuting. Apostleship is a gift of the Holy Spirit to some people with the experience of Jesus. It's not an experience for all people. Not all of us are called to be apostles. It is only for some who have been gifted this way. We actually get this understanding from the book of Ephesians. We can read this in that book. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Apostles are a gift to the church. And if you, in growing in your faith, intend... To become a mature believer, you need to devote yourself to apostolic teaching. And so even though the 12 are gone, God continues to gift some people with this gift of apostleship. If you are going to grow in your faith, you need to grow from somebody who really has experience with Jesus in their lives. One of the, the things that, uh, that makes me sad for my kids is they have never got to experience the thrill and the joy and the excitement of my favorite teams winning a championship. By that, I mean the Cincinnati Reds and the Dallas Cowboys. It, they have not won a championship since my kids were born, and just so you know, I don't blame y'all for that. It's not your fault. But in the 90s, the Cowboys were the football dynasty. They were the team that had it all. And, and for the last Super Bowl they won, they had a new player to really help them win. He was, uh, you know, the, the flashy, standout interview guy among all the great players that are now in the Hall of Fame off that. And you remember his name. It was, well, it still is, <laughs> Deion Sanders, also known as Prime Time. Or in his old age, he shortened it to prime. Man, Dion had game. He was a lockdown cornerback, and he had money, and he had you know fame, and he had reputation. Everything that a lot of people want in their lives, Dion had. But if you know his story, 
you know that inside there was a void. Inside he was empty. He sat on a hill with his car one night and he actually thought to himself, all I have to do is hit the accelerator and life will be over and it will not be a problem anymore. But he didn't do that. And instead, Dion discovered faith in Jesus Christ. His life was changed. It's still changing. If you hear him talk today, the impact that coming to faith in Christ has had on his life is greater than anything he ever achieved on the football field or the baseball field because he's the only person in history that has played on a World Series champion and a Super Bowl champion, and he actually played a World Series in an NFL game on the same day. An impressive person. And when you're that impressive, Everything you do gets in the news. And so it was that when he converted to faith in Christ, all of a sudden, churches want Dion to come. If, if you were here, you may remember a church in the north side actually had Dion come just weeks after his conversion to speak in their worship service on Sunday morning. I remember one of the questions I had when I saw that he was speaking at that church is exactly how much money does it take to get Dion Sanders to come speak in your church? Ain't in our budget. <laughs> but the second thing was, for a new convert to the faith, there's nothing that warms our souls more than hearing the story of life transformation. There's nothing greater than hearing the testimony of someone who has been saved from all the trappings that were leading them down a bad path so that they would come to a new place in life. As a new convert, he could not give apostolic teaching. He had not matured. He had not grown in his own understanding of faith and who Christ is. Today, different situation. But if you're going to follow a spiritual leader, apostolic teaching, people who have been with Jesus, people who have experienced his life-changing power are people that you can trust. So that's the answer to the first question, who were the apostles? The second question is, what were they teaching? I mean, if, if you're going to follow apostolic teaching, what were they teaching? That's important to know, don't you think? It's, you know, apostles teaching. We know the apostles, what were they teaching? Well, this much I can assure you, they weren't having Bible study. They, they, they didn't have a Bible. It's not like they could gather and say, okay, we're, we're all going to meet you know, at Benton's house next week and we're going to study the gospel of John. John was there. He had no gospel yet. He would write it down later because they understood the importance of that. They, they didn't form the 12, did not form an editorial board so they could develop a curriculum and a catechism for all of us to study. Even though if you read that stuff that we call the New Testament, there is in there a good curriculum and catechism for us to study. No, they basically could only teach one thing, and that is the apostles taught new believers about Jesus, what he did, what he said. Remember the, the context. This is the day of Pentecost. Thousands of Jews have come to this place, and a small group of them actually believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And then there's others among them who were in the crowd yelling, crucify him whenever Pilate asked, do you want Jesus or Barabbas? Crucify Jesus, that's what they said. And then there were a whole bunch of others. They were just Jews. They were coming to Pentecost. They had not heard of Jesus. All these thousands of people, and you can divide them up into three ways, and now when they hear the sound of the wind and they see the fire and they hear the speaking in tongues, all of a sudden they're like, what are we supposed to do? And that's when Peter says, well, repent of your sin, <laughs> turn to God, and be baptized. That's what you're supposed to do. And then it says, and we looked at this last week, that Peter taught them for a long time. What do you think he was teaching? Because he had started with the prophecy to Joel, and these are Jewish people, I think what they were teaching them is how Jesus fulfills the prophecies that we would say are in the Old Testament, how all the promises God made through the prophets are now fulfilled in Jesus. Like when Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. Or when they say, you know, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How this suffering servant will bear the penalty of all our 
sin, that he was bruised for our transgressions and wounded for our iniquities. Do you know how many of those prophecies exist? A lot. I don't know the answer. It's a lot. Because when I saw this, there was one person that said there were 300 and then the next person I read said there were 456. And the next person said there were 574. So I don't really know how many there were. But whether it's 300 or almost 600, that's a lot of things to be fulfilled hundreds of years later in one person. You see, they were teaching them about Jesus because they're trying to help them answer the most important question we ever answer. Who is Jesus? And at the end of Matthew's gospel, you can put that scripture back up there, Steve. At, at the end of Matthew's gospel, what Matthew is doing is he's trying to convince the Jews Jesus is the Messiah. And the last thing that he records Jesus is saying is, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. It is who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what Jesus taught us. This is what it means by the apostles' teaching. Now, we have teachers in here. I know we have some people in here that are teachers, educators, and I bet all of them would agree to something I'm about to say, and that is this. It doesn't matter how good a teacher you are if people don't learn. And with the apostles' teaching, it doesn't matter what the apostles teach if we're not committed to learning, this is what we see whenever it, it says people were baptized and they, Peter continued to preach for a long time and it says, and then all believers devoted themselves to apostles' teaching. It was a priority. It was necessary. It was a must. And I think what we discover when we truly apply ourselves to this apostolic teaching is, is we discover this is where our life begins to take on new meaning. If we feel like life is worthless, our submission to and our obedience to what God is telling us and teaching us through the apostles can really be a turning point in our lives. One of the uh, TV shows that's got a lot of popularity, I've, I've only watched it a few times, but is the TV show Antiques Roadshow. Any of y'all watch that? Wait, keep your hand up. I need to. Yeah, just as I thought. Consistency in all three services. Only old people are raising their hands. <laughs> because we are antiques. Um, <laughs> you know, before Robin and I had kids, we decorated our home with antiques. We love going to antique stores. And, and the older you get, you look at stuff and go, <laughs> I remember what that is. We used to have one of those. But if you've ever watched Antiques Roadshow, or even if you haven't ever watched Antiques Roadshow, what happens is this, this roadshow comes to a town, and people are invited to bring their antiques, and sometimes people walk away knowing more about what they bought, and other times people walk away very excited because they have just discovered they have something of great value. And so Antiques Roadshow was in Secaucus, New Jersey. Really, that's unimportant, but how often do you get to say Secaucus, New Jersey, when you're talking to people? And this woman comes up, and she's got a, a table with her, and uh, the appraisers that were there ask her, you know, tell us about this table that you've got. And she said, well, back in 1967, uh, we had just bought a house, and we needed a little table to sit in the entryway, and and." I was at a garage sale, and I saw this table, and it was dirty and dingy, but I thought, you know, it's about the right size, and I can probably clean it up, and it's an odd shape. That'll, that'll be a good thing to have. And so the people that were having the garage sale said, you know, we're asking $30 for this table, and she said, uh, I only have $25 on me. Who argues over $5 at a garage sale, right? And so she bought the table for $25. She took it home, cleaned it up, and for over 30 years, it sat in the entryway into their house. And so the appraisers told her, they said, well, we want you to know when we saw you coming with that table, we got excited because we think we know what kind of table that is. And they, they took the top off and they looked and, you know, you could see the imprinting from whoever built it. And they said, yeah, this is what we thought. They said, this is a table that was built by Seymour Brothers. The Seymour Brothers were uh, furniture manufacturers in Boston in the 1800s. Now, this table was over 100 years old. And 
They said, so what you have here is a Seymour mahogany card table. That's what you have purchased. They said, now, we don't want you to get excited. You spent $25 on this, and we want you to know that depending on the market and what people want to do, you could sell this table for $225 to $250,000. They failed miserably. She got really excited. She took it to Sotheby's in New York to auction it off, and she wasn't surprised when it was 200000 and 225 and 250 but then it continued to go up. She sold the table for $490,000, a $25 investment that yielded almost a half million dollars in return. Sign me up. Sign me up. Y'all want me to sign you up? Because whenever we apply ourselves to apostolic teaching, we grow in a faith that is priceless even when we feel worthless. A faith that is unshakable even when we feel shaken. A faith that is powerful when we feel powerless. Beloved, I, I ask you sincerely, it doesn't matter what the apostles teach if we're not willing to learn. Have you applied yourself to apostolic learning through a Sunday school class, through a small group, when we start midweek in the fall, are you going to apply yourself so you have that kind of powerful, unshakable faith? God created the church for that. One of the things I, I want to be clear about is when we brought Pastor Josh on staff, is a lot of people, in fact, a friend yesterday said, oh, we hear you got a new youth director. No, we didn't. We have a discipleship pastor. His primary job is going to be to work with students. But he's going to work with all of us. Children, youth, adults, to help us be grounded in apostolic teaching. But it does no good unless we devote ourselves to that. So I wonder what would God speak to your heart today? What new step of faith is God calling you to take? We're going to sing a song in a minute, and if you want to kind of say, God, this is what I think you're saying, and you want to make that commitment, we have our kneeling rails that you can come and pray at, or you can sit there and pray in your seat, or as always, Josh and Stephanie and I will be up front to pray with you after the service, if that's what you desire. But what are we going to do? God has created the church out of people like us. Do we want that church to be strong or do we want that church to be eh? Let's pray. So, holy God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is poured out on all of us who believe. The Spirit that baptizes us and gives us new purpose and new relationship. And so it is, Lord Jesus, that we ask that your spirit would move in our hearts in such a way that we are devoted to learning the things that you would teach us. And we're thankful, God, that we don't have some painful quest that we have to go on like we want to be a monk. But instead, you reveal yourself to us through the witness of your people, the truth of the scriptures and through the witness of your spirit. Move in us, we pray. Amen. As you're able, would you stand as we sing? As I walk this great unknown, questions come and questions go. for the pain did I cry these tears in vain I don't want to live in fear I want to trust that you are near trust your grace can be seen in both triumph and tragedy I have this hope in the dead
Friends, I'm so glad that we could worship together. Again, dads, on your way out, there's a gift we have. If you would like to take that, or you don't have to be a dad, men, you can take those. Friends, it is a good thing that God has given apostles to help us learn who Jesus is and what he can do in our lives. Go in peace.